DNP 102.3. You are listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. Our guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. Normally, Johnny T does this show, and he's not feeling well today. So I'm Larry Carroll, and I'm going to fill in for him. I'm going to try because Johnny T does a heck of a job with these interviews. I'm going to look over to my left here. Sam Hitchcock's in the studio, and uh, he's got some stories going back from when, as far as he can remember anyway, um, he's always had a love for music, and he's going to share some of his music stories with us. So good evening, Sam. Good evening, Larry. How are you doing? Real good, real good. Why don't we start with like some of your first memories of of music, like first instrument, that kind of thing, uh, first inspiration? Well, music has always been very important in my life. Uh, even before I, I played any instruments, I used to uh, play the 45s that uh, were on my older sister's stereo. And uh, sometimes she got a little upset with me because sometimes I didn't take care of them as well as uh, she did. But uh, I think that's where where it started for me and I, I think I got my interest in music from my mother. My father, his uh, he didn't play any instruments, he just listened to the radio. But my mother, she, she had played piano. And uh, when I got old enough, then I started playing in uh, the band in uh, school. I played baritone and uh, I didn't really get into dance band music until I was out of school for a couple of years. I was, matter of fact, 1965, I had graduated and been out of school for a couple of years. When I started to, uh, took up an interest in guitar, I was working at Ford Garage in Uricksville and I, I bought one of these, uh, I think it was a Montgomery Wards guitar. It came in the case and the case had an amplifier built in with it. So it was all in one. You just uh, open the case, take the guitar out, set the case up, turn it on, and, Plug it in, and, and you would, there you would go. Uh, didn't didn't go very far with that. I was struggling with that, and uh, so the the manager at the Ford Garage where I was working, uh, who was quite a musician himself, uh, told me he says, "Well, he says, he said, why don't you uh, play bass?" He said, uh, "The strings are bigger, and there's two less strings, so maybe you have a little bit of luck with that." So uh, I bought a bass in town here in Dover and an amplifier and uh, I started playing bass and uh, that worked out real well. I, that matter of fact, that was uh, my favorite instrument until I, until I moved to keyboards and even when I moved to keyboards, after six years of playing bass, I kept the bass in the program. I played left-handed keyboard bass and, and, and when I sit down at a keyboard now, I, I, it's awkward for me not to be playing the bass notes. Well, that's interesting because the bass with the four strings mm -hmm. okay and so you're playing basically rhythm something similar to like what the the drum line is something like that well the drums the, the kick drum and the bass are run pretty much close together they're they're foundation instruments and so a lot of times when the bass drum is hitting the bass uh, instrument is hitting too they kind of complement each other. But uh, I remember the first song I ever played on bass was uh, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, uh, what the heck was it? I played a Peter, Paul, and Mary song, uh, and then another song that I played with the uh, off the record was The Game of Love by Wayne Fontana and, and the Mindbenders. Yeah, I remember and, that one. And there was one, one part in there that I, I looked forward to. It was uh, about in the middle of the song where the bass would play by itself, go bum, 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 bum. And I played that song over and over again just so I could play that part. Uh, and then from that point on, uh, you know, I just, uh, every song that I started uh, working on, I, um, you know, picked something with an interesting bass part. But the first band I was ever with I got together with some guys. Uh, well, actually, the first band I was with, uh, the the, serv the service director at the Ford Garage was trying to help me get into the into music, and he told me, he said, hey, he said, uh, there's a band that needs a bass player, and he says, I, I hate to do this to you because he said they're not really that good, and and so I'm not going to tell you the name of them, <laughs> uh, but it was a polka band, and. Uh, 
polkas with bass parts or polka music is pretty easy to play. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started playing with this band, and it, it was piece of cake you know it was very was easy it, was it a, a paid gig actual yeah it was paid gig paid. i was getting i was making <laughs> money you know i was uh, a paid musician professional musician but this guy this uh, uh accordion player he had uh, it was one of those push button accordions it didn't have the keys like you'd have from a, with a keyboard it was push buttons we used to kid him we'd say hey did you take typing lessons to learn how to play that thing <laughs> and uh Every once in a while, one of the buttons would stick, and he'd smack it with the palm of his hand, and then occasionally that button would go flying across the floor, and he'd have to go chase it. So we had a lot of fun with that band. But did you actually, on the bass, did you teach yourself, or did you get lessons? Or? I yeah, I taught myself a little bit, and then Brad, the, the service director of, at the Ford Garage, he hooked me up with a guy named Bill Whitmer, who was quite a bass player. And Denison, I took a few lessons off of him, and then I, I just pretty much worked on it myself. I, it was see, it wasn't too difficult for me to pick the bass parts out of most of the music. And uh, like I say, you know, six years after playing bass, I decided to switch to keyboards. And, uh, and the reason I did that was because if you're in a band as a bass player and the band breaks up. You know, you're you're just playing a support instrument. So I wanted to do something that was a lead instrument. So I went back to Brad, and I told him I wanted to play keyboard. So he started teaching me music theory. You know, just basic chord progression. Of course, music theory is based on a piano keyboard. So I started studying a little bit of music theory and, and using it with a piano keyboard. That's kind of how I got into uh, playing piano. Did you get piano lessons? Or? I took piano lessons way back when when I was in school I hated them I got up to the point where my mother told me that if you finish this book of lessons you can quit so I dug into it and I started playing these songs and and was doing fairly well with the first book and when I finished that book I quit I should have, should have never done that because the, the music that I play now, the piano style that I play now, isn't what people would teach. It's just, you know, what works for me. I think a lot of times, even when I had the music store here and the kids would come in for drum lessons with Bobby, they would want to right away play a song. And Bobby said, you know, you got to learn the basics first. And Bobby's good. Bobby's great. And it's And it's tough, you know, when you're young like that, you want to play songs, you know, I don't want to just be playing paradiddles or something, you know. And so I can understand when you're taking lessons, it's not the most exciting thing, learning the basics of it. Well, Kelly Goodrich, I think, is the one that, that really influenced me to do the bass. Because when I was uh, starting to play the keyboards, Kelly and I got together. We were playing in, in, at the Rose Room. And, uh, you know, the Rose Room... The best thing I can say about the Rose Room is you it was steady money. You play every Friday and Saturday night for as long as you wanted to. And uh, we we were a four-piece band. At one point, we had a guitar player, a bass. Kelly was playing drums, and I was doing a little bit of keyboard. So the guitar player and the bass player took off. They wanted to do something a little bit more exciting. So Kelly and I decided to keep practicing together with what we had, the drums and the keyboard, and wait until we could find another guitar and bass player. So we're playing at the Rose Room, and at that time, the bass part that we would play on the keyboard was just hitting one note. In other words, if I'm playing chords in the key of C, we just hit, constantly hit one note of the bass. Uh, and then after a while, that got a little bit boring, so we'd maybe do a, a triad, a bass triad, the three notes of the, of the basic chord. You know, <laughs> the interesting thing was, people were coming up that were in the bar and requesting songs and we'd tell them we're just practicing we're not really doing anything but they'd send a maybe send a drink up to the to the <laughs> stage <laughs> so how do you turn that down yeah. <laughs> so we started playing requests and uh, the next thing i knew kelly come in and said hey we got a job next month down at alpa lane's I said, Are you, uh, what? I said, doing what? Sweeping the alleys or what? <laughs> he says, no, playing music. I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, we only know a, a half dozen songs. So we spent that month working up 
trying to put as many songs together as we could. And we worked up, I think, 30 songs, which is not enough for a three-hour night. But we went in at Apple Lanes with 30 songs, and that was the beginning of the impromptu, Kelly and I, that lasted five years. But uh, the funny thing about those first weekends that we'd play, once we played our 30 songs, then we had to figure out some way that we could play other ones. So what we did, we'd we just make an announcement say, hey, somebody requested to hear this song again, <laughs> whether they did or not. Yeah. And we got through the night that way, and then eventually we learned enough songs that we could, could play. All right, you are listening to DNP 102.3. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. <clears throat> I'm Larry Carroll filling in for Johnny T, who uh, was just a little under the weather. And uh, I'm going to play one of uh, Sam's favorite songs. Every once in a while, we'll play, throw in some music, some of uh, the uh, music that Sam kind of, you know, from time to time grew up with, or in some bands probably played some of these songs. Anyway, here's something from the James Gang. <laughs> DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. I'm Larry Carroll hosting, substituting for Johnny T, who couldn't quite make it tonight. In studio with me is our special guest tonight, is Sam Hitchcock. And uh, we were sharing some stories, if you just tuned in, about the Rose Room. And, and uh, we played one of Sam's favorite songs, the James Gang. I understand you you played that a few times. Yes, I, yes, I did. I played that uh, not at the Rose Room. I played bass on that song uh, when we were at, uh, at a later band at the Mustang, a popular night spot. Uh, and I had played bass on that song. It was, that was a, band, a song that a lot of bands uh, likes to play. Matter of fact, that band, uh, James Gang, had uh, a song before that called Funk 48, but it didn't make near the splash that Funk 49 did. From, I'm from New York originally, and so I, I hear some of these stories about the different venues and different bands and stuff. Where was that Rose Room? You mean the stories of the Rose Room didn't make it to they New did, York? They didn't make it oh, out to amazing. Long Island. That's no. amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Rose Room was uh, at the Hotel Lee in uh, downtown New Philadelphia, and I guess back in the 40s, I guess at one day it was, it was a real popular spot. Uh, they had, I guess they had some real name, you know, some name bands in their entertainment. But it, uh, when we played there, it kind of had kind of went downhill. It wasn't uh, not because of you, right? <laughs> well, I hope not. I don't know. Maybe it did. But uh, as I said before, you know, the 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 best thing you could say about the Rose Room was it was a steady, steady place to play on weekends and. We didn't really learn a whole lot of new songs there. You didn't have to. You know, you just kept playing the same old stuff, and that's what they requested. So, But something that one night John Cush was the drummer at the time. This is toward our end of uh, toward the end of our time at the Rose Room. I think John Cush, uh, Kip Kramer, and myself were the three that were there. And Johnny uh, had broken drumsticks, you know, he was playing. And this, there was two lights that, that we had shined onto the curtain on the back. One, one of the right, uh, the lights that was at, that would be stage right went into a back room and, you know, we just kind of turned it up and focused it on that back curtain to give it a little bit of an effect. And on the other side was the women's restroom. And there was a similar light over top of the door there. So we turned that light up and it wouldn't stay that way. It would fall back down. So I took one of Johnny's broken drumsticks and just very carefully propped that light up so that it would shine on the curtain. And I'm talking to the guys, and I said, you know, we're going to be lucky if that thing lasts the night, if it stays there the whole night. Well, then, you know, we finished out the night, finished out the, the term there. I, I went on to play in Mustang for years and, and, and several different places. Probably about 15 years later, I was walking down this, the sidewalk in front of the hotel, Lee, and I looked inside, and, and Lou Galanga was in there, which one of the owners. And I walked in, and I talked to him, and I'm just kind of looking back over the room, 
uh, reminiscing about, you know, some of the times when we used to play there, and I just happened to glance over the women's restroom there, and I looked, and I couldn't believe it. A drumstick <laughs> was still there 15 years later, it, which tells you how, how often they must have dusted. <laughs> But uh, that was crazy. But when we left the Rose Room, uh, uh, we were getting good crowds there. And, and uh, the guy who was the manager of uh, the Mustang was named Don Dogweiler. And probably all the musicians that have played any time around this area know Don Dogweiler. He was the manager of the Mustang. And he was concerned that we were drawing too big of a crowd at the Rose Room. I guess on Friday and Saturday nights, it was maybe taking some, some, what he felt like was taking some business away from the Mustang. So he came in, listened to us one night, and then he offered, he says, why don't you come to the Mustang? We'll stick another, uh, you know, we were three piece. He said, we'll stick another guitar player with you and, uh, uh, you know, start managing you, putting on a big, bigger circuit than just the Rose Room. <laughs> So we took him up on that. We went to the Mustang in, uh, in 1969, and we were the house band there until toward the end of 71 when I left the band and, and decided to go to Florida. Where was the, the Mustang? Where was that located? The Mustang was out on 39. It was Big Red Barn. I think the first thing I ever remember the Mustang being called was the White Stallion. And at that time, it had miniature golf inside. It had some uh, trampolines outside that were at ground level. It was just kind of like a uh, amusement place. And then after that, I think after the, and some people can probably correct me on this, but after the, it was the White Stallion, I think is when it changed to the Mustang. Mm -hmm. And that's when... There was a group of uh, investors, uh, they called it Dolegio Company. And the DO of Dolegio was Don Dogweiler, uh, Lee Foster, and Joe Sharon. That's where the Dolegio came. But Don was the on-site manager who ran the place. There were some pretty big name band groups that used to play there. We were the house band, so we played every Sunday night. And you'd get uh, five, 600 people there on a Sunday night. Now, do you know about when that closed down or when that... I th the fire was sometime in the 70s. I'm not... I don't remember exactly when, but I remember standing there and watching watching it burn and seeing all the memories go up in the air, and uh, oh. I, I could feel the heat from it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think one of the... You know, one of the things that John had asked if uh, something about if, any brush, if we had any brushes with any famous people... One time we pulled into the uh, Mustang to practice, and we we used to leave our stuff set up on the stage because nobody would bother. And we had a key to the place. So we pulled into the parking lot, and we could hear uh, music upstairs. And so we we figured that's got to be our equipment. So we were, we were upset. We were mad that somebody's up there messing around on our equipment. So we opened the door and went storming up the stairs, and there was the Ohio Express <laughs> playing on our equipment and playing some of the heaviest blues you ever heard. And so we, you know, we didn't care then, it was all right. <laughs> so we sat there and we listened and then whenever they finally took a break, we got talking to them, they apologized for being on our equipment because we told, told them it was ours. And uh, I asked the one of the guys, you know, they had the, I think their hit song was like yummy, yummy, yummy and chewy, chewy and <laughs> all this bubblegum right. stuff that we all hated. <laughs> you know, I asked one of the guys to say, I said, you know, I said, I can't believe this. I said, you guys are great. I said, yeah. you know, you're playing some, some decent stuff here. I says, how come you play all that other crap? He says, because that's where the money's at. He said, that's <laughs> what you're paying us to play. He yeah. said, we would get money for this yeah. stuff. You're listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local, and our guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. How about I play a song uh, for the memory of the Mustang? Something from Deep Purple. It's called Smoke on the Played Water. Played this many times. <laughs> All 
right, DNP 102.3 FM, and you are listening to Saturday Night Live and Local. Tonight we have uh, Sam Hitchcock in as our special guest. And uh, first, let me take care of some business here. DNP 102.3 is supported by you and local businesses. RushHourDM.com. You're listening to Saturday Night Live and Local. Johnny T is absent tonight. He's not feeling very well. I'm Larry Carroll. I'm filling in for him. And once again, our special guest, Sam Hitchcock, he, we're telling some great stories about the Mustang and about the, the what was it, the Rose? The Rose Room. <laughs> okay, but what, that's not what you said during, during one of the breaks, though. It was the Rose something else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want me to tell that story? Yeah, go ahead. Tell that. Well, the, the Rose Room was not, uh, it was uh, kind of a dive when we used to play it, and uh, uh, we used to refer to it as the Rose Dump. And a matter of fact, when I was would be talking to my wife, I would refer to it as the Rose Dump, not really thinking about my young kids being within earshot and hearing that. And one day... Later in time, uh, my kids and I were walking down the street in New Philadelphia, and we were, you know, during broad daylight, we walked by the Rose Room, and the doors were open, looked in, and there was the owner uh, standing there at the bar. So I walked in, and kids came in with me, of course, and, and we were talking, and just general conversation, chit-chat, and, and all of a sudden, my little girl... Michelle looked up at me, and she says, Daddy, is this the Rose Dump? And I could have crawled under a table. <laughs> the kids say the dump. Oh, I know. you got to be careful what you say around kids. <laughs> anyway, um, how about some more of those stories from, like, the Mustang? And... Mustang was a very special time in my life. Uh, the band that we had there was the Reformation. It was the one that generated from uh, the uh, the band that we had at the Rose Room. And, and Don made good on his promise. You know, he put us on a circuit all over Ohio playing different places. And, of course, we were the house band at the Mustang. Uh, the favorite songs, uh, some of the, the groups that we favored the most were Grand Funk Railroad, uh, Three Dog Night, and one of the groups that, that we all used to like to listen to quite a bit was Vanilla Fudge. Vanilla Fudge was a group that, that used to take songs that were recorded by other people and make them heavy. Uh, the, yeah, I'm very familiar with the Vanilla Fudge. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, they were. Long Island. They used to play at the Action House on Long Island, and I saw them a number of times. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. Well, they, you know, Mark Stein was the keyboard player for the Vanilla Fudge, and uh, I guess he's the, uh, the musician who introduced the Hammond B3 into rock and roll music. And uh, you, you know, you had played uh, "Smoke on the Water" here just a little bit ago. And the interesting thing about that is that the Vanilla Fudge, when they picked one of their songs and played, uh, played it heavy uh, with, of course, heavy B3 organ sounds. I guess that was quite an inspiration to Deep Purple, and they started using uh, the B3 in a lot of their songs too. Uh, probably the the most a uh, popular song that uh, that I can remember Vanilla Fudge doing was Keep Me Hanging On. That uh, was an old Supremes number. And just about a month ago, uh, I found out that they were going to be playing at the Tangier in Akron. And also was amazed to find out that three of the four original members were still with the band. Uh, it's Mark Stein, the keyboard player, Vince Martell, the guitar player, and, of course, Carmen Apice, the drummer. Uh, they didn't have Tim Bogert wasn't with them. They said that he retired, but they had another bass player that was every bit as good. And uh, I took my son, uh, Jim Hitchcock, who's a Dover police uh, day shift captain in Dover here, and I also took my uh, sound engineer from the sound company, my chief engineer, Travis Green, who's almost like a son to me. I took, uh, went with both of them, we went up there and we sat, uh, we had tickets right in front of the stage, and, and that was one of the greatest conference, concerts that I'd ever been to, and my son, who goes to many concerts, he said it was one of, one of his favorites. Hey, why don't we play some Vanilla Fudge? Well, do you have Keep Me Hanging On in there somewhere? Um, let me see. 
<laughs> I guess I do. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> DNP 102.3 FM, Saturday night live and local with our guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. We also have Vanessa in here taking some pictures for us. Hopefully we'll get them up onto Facebook sometime. Back to Sam Hitchcock and sharing stories about the Vanilla Fudge and, and some of your traveling bands. Do you have any road stories? Yeah, the, probably the, the most exciting time I ever had on the road, and this was really on the road, uh, was with Kelly Goodrich. Uh, Kelly and I, who had, you know, when we started uh, playing as the impromptu, because uh, we couldn't find two other uh, musicians to play, uh, that, that thing took off. Uh, and I think one of the, the interesting things, one of the reasons that we were able to get jobs back then was because we were two-piece we could give, uh, you know, we were competing with bands that were charging for four and five pieces, and we're only two, so we didn't have to have as much money. And uh, but we were able to to make the sound full. Uh, you know, we uh, we both realized that we had to play drums a little bit harder. We had to play keys, put a little bit more in the key parts, if we were only two pieces, and it seemed to work out real good. Uh, now, were both of you singers? Yeah, we both sang. Uh, we both played. Uh, <laughs> we both played drums and keyboard, and that was one of the unique things about the impromptu. Uh, when Kelly wanted to play the keyboard, that left me standing there, so I sat down on his drums and started messing around with them. This is still while we were at the Rose Room, and I learned to play acceptable drums uh, while he played the keyboard and we kept switching back and forth we used to get some strange looks when we were in some of the clubs because people would look one time and we're on maybe i'm sitting on the drums and he's on the keys and they the next time they turn around they're looking and we're in different locations so that used to kind of throw people for a loop yeah that is different and usually you don't see that well i learned a lot from kelly uh kelly's quite a musician he, he's on cruise ship right now uh, and uh, he's he's just an amazing musician, and I, you know, I owe a lot of what I'm able to do on keys now to Kelly. He was fun to work with. Uh, we were on the Holiday Inn circuit, probably, oh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half. We played out in the Midwest. We played out in Texas, uh, Galapagos, uh, Cincinnati, and we had a lot of great uh, great experiences on the road. Uh, one of the times that that uh, was kind of the scariest was when we were in South Texas. Uh, we got to know some people down there at one of the Holiday Inns. They talked about, we were only about 110 miles from the Mexican border, and we wanted to go down and get some uh, souvenirs. So this guy that we met in the bar says, hey, I'll take you down, no problem. We'll go across, we'll get some souvenirs and come back. So we did that. We drove across the Mexican border, and we, you know, we got some uh, a sombrero and, and different things that uh, take back some, you know, blankets and things like that. And when we went to go back across, uh, of course, the border patrol stopped us, and we were standing off the side. And while they're running the dog through this guy's car in the trunk and all over, walking over the bags of our stuff, ripping the back seat out and everything like that. And I turned around to Kelly and I said, you know. I said, if they find drugs in this guy's car, I said, we're probably never going to see daylight again. We'll be in a Mexican prison somewhere. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't, though, and we were able to get back across the border and, and get back to the Holiday Inn for that night, though. But it was kind of scary there for a while. <laughs> there's there's lots of good stories when you're traveling about, huh? Yeah, there were, there were some good times. You know, when we were on the road, we didn't have... Uh, the first place we went was Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we had been playing... Strictly top 40. When we went in, the, uh, the the lounge was called the Bull Room at the Holiday Inn East, and it was a huge lounge. Uh, it would, uh, usually on Saturday night, we'd have between 800 and 1,000 people in there. Just a huge lounge. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we played the first time, the manager, his name was Warren Houch, and he sat us down at a table, and he says, he says, let me tell you a couple things. He said, these guys are coming in here. He said, they're cowboys. And he said, they wear the cowboy hat and they don't take them off. And he says, I don't want to tell you guys your business, but he says, we're about 45 
miles from Muskogee, Oklahoma. He says, I'm going to tell you, if you guys don't play Okie from Muskogee, he says, these cowboys will run you out of town. <laughs> so you know what we did? <laughs> we we uh, spent that evening learning uh, Okie from Muskogee. And it, was, it wasn't a difficult song. It only has about three or four chords in it, and it was uh, easy to... Easy harmony parts, so and that it was one of the most popular. We had to play that thing about three or four times a night on a five-hour evening job. You played also with the Delphian, right? Yes, I did. When when we come back, Kelly and I come back off the road. He decided to get married and stay home, so I went back out as a single. I played at uh, Chillicothe Holiday Inn for a month, and I came back and I played at a place called the Lombrusco Lounge in Zanesville. And then I came back and I played a month, uh, I think a month of December, at the Delphian, the Delphian Inn, uh, which was a nice job. But, you know, it was getting lonely. It was the third month that I'd played as a single and it was, it was just kind of lonely. I really didn't enjoy doing the single routine. So one day Carl Dreer came in and uh, I said, Carl, drag your drums in here and, and sit in with me. So he did that. And we had a great time, and uh, that kind of was responsible for starting another two-piece band that I had called Gemini. Carl and I had uh, yeah, yeah. have been together off and on with the band Gemini for 25 years. Uh, and I tell people we lasted longer than most marriages. <laughs> and uh, we had, had a lot of great times. Carl is a, a great guy to work with, and I, and I guess you've had uh, yeah. some of Carl was in here a few weeks back, and I remember him telling stories about that. Yeah, Carl and I, as a matter of fact, we, we may even, uh, he keeps threatening to come down and uh, go over some songs and maybe go out and do a, a Gemini night once in a while. Well, I think, I think it would go over. Well, I, I would love yeah. to do that, so I yeah, hope Carl, he's serious. <laughs> he is, he's a great guy. Um, how about some grand funk? Grand Funk would be would be great when we were uh, with the Reformation and played at different spots. Grand Funk uh, was, like I say, it was one of the, the bands that we favored, and we would usually start off with a song called Are You Ready? Not only we've got a special story to tell you about that, we played a, a high school job in Delphus, Ohio, which is over by Van Wert. It took us four hours to get there. And we had no idea what to expect. We were we're all pretty much wore out by the time we got there. We walked in the gymnasium, the gymnasium of this high school, and they had a huge stage right out in the middle of the gymnasium. We set up everything on there, and the gymnasium was full of kids, and we kicked off with that song, Are You Ready? And you'd have thought we were grand funk themselves. The, the kids were throwing themselves on the stage, and all of a sudden that tiredness went away, and we were playing music. So it was a great night. Well, we don't I, don't, I didn't seem to find Are You Ready in our library, but how about some kind of wonderful? That's a good one, too. DNP 102.3 FM. You're listening to Saturday Night Live and Local. Our guest speaker tonight is Sam Hitchcock. As I mentioned before, we do have Vanessa in here taking pictures for us. She always does such a great job. Next up, let's see, Sam. Let's let's talk about what happened towards the end of your singing career. Carl and I were were playing pretty uh, regular right about spring of 2003. Uh, I was having some problems, some um, medical discomfort and I went to the doctor and found out I had cancer. Uh, I had uh, what they called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The doctor told me I had about 25 percent chance of survival. You know I was kind of shocked. You know he told me uh, that uh, he said I you know took all kind of blood tests and everything like that and he said I'm going to send these to Ohio State. But he said I don't want to wait till they come back. He said that it, it, he said I, I'm pretty sure I know what you've got. And he said, with your permission, I would like to hit you with a double dose of chemo as though you were coming back the second time with a remission. And I told him, Doc, I said, hit me with your best shot. I said, give yeah. me whatever. So uh, he did. And uh, I had scheduled to practice that night uh, earlier 
with Carl, and uh, I told him that, and he said, oh, he said, he said, you're not going to be practicing anything. He says, you're going to be flat on your back after I hit you with about five hours of this chemo, five or six hours, something like that. So after that was done, uh, my sister Patty drove me home, and I'm l- laying on a recliner in a couch, and it just bothered me that I wasn't, you know, we had scheduled practice, and I hadn't said anything to Carl about it. Uh, so I got up and went down to Carl's house. My stuff was already sitting there, and I went ahead and we practiced. We got we put in probably a couple hours. Uh, it was was difficult. It was difficult to sing because I didn't have much in the way of wind, but. Uh, we did it anyway. We played a few jobs, and then uh, at one point uh, I had uh, was having problems uh, with my throat. It was swelling shut, and the doctor did a tracheotomy on me. He told me if I didn't, he said I would, I would suffocate. So they poked a hole in my throat, and it's uh, left my throat a little bit rough, I think. I don't know if there's scar tissue in my vocal cords or what, but I, I can't seem to uh, sing quite as high as I used to. And So I just quit playing music. Uh, about that same time, I got it into, uh, started a, a sound company, and uh, I've been doing the sound company ever since. Uh, the Travis Green that I mentioned earlier, he's my chief engineer, great kid. The sound company kind of took the place of playing music but uh recently uh you know i've had the opportunity to send in with my son a couple times and he's invited me to play on stage with his band and so i went ahead and bought another b3 (laughs) (laughs) fit of insanity and and i bought a a kurzweil keyboard that i've been playing probably a couple two two or three times a day and and i think i'm going to get back into it again i don't know how well i'll I'll be able to sing but but i love music and and i've always enjoyed performing and so we're going to give it another shot and so now you're you're health health wise um you got a clean bill yeah the doctor said if it didn't come back after five years he said he didn't think it would and after 10 years uh well actually it's been 12 years now but the last time I went in, we were discussing it, and he said, no, he said, you're, he said it shouldn't come back. He said, uh, you know, he, he couldn't believe the recovery because he said, when you came to me, he said, you were dying. Well, and you know what I think, too? Just the fact of you getting up, going to practice, and, and just carrying on with your life, I think that helps. I, I, I do. Plus, I was uh, on a lot of prayer lists. Uh, a lot of people put me on prayer lists of, of churches I didn't belong to, and I, and I I believe that 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 was very uh, influential in my life. Uh, but what you said, you know, I I I had to, you know, when you get this kind of news, you have to start thinking about a lot of things, and you know, it it didn't really put me in a in depression because I had had a good life. I raised my kids. Uh, I had a good career. I had a lot of things that a lot of people haven't had in life. So I thought to myself, if, if this is it, if this is going to be the end of it, you know, I'm going to go out on my feet. So I kept, uh, I made arrangements for everything I was involved in to be covered by somebody else if I wasn't there. But then after I did that, I kept going. I kept uh, I would go over to the to summer showcase where I was doing the concerts. Uh, I'd only be able to get up and announce the show, and then I'd have to go lay down. But uh, I went to the teen center. I wasn't able to really do too much other than sit in my office and watch the kids outside the door. But I think that staying with everything and going as as much as I could, I think it really helped out. Positive attitude. How did you get started at the teen center? How'd that come about? Well, when I retired at the police department, I'd already been doing the concerts at uh, Tuscore Park. I'd been doing those since 1999. Carrie Gardner, who was my boss there, asked me, he said, uh, he knew I was getting close to retirement. He said, would you, we're going to build a new teen center. Uh, we had benefactor was uh, Max Miller, Max and Irma Miller, great people, uh, had supplied the money to build a teen center. And this was going to be a teen center not open just on Saturday nights. It was going to be open every day. And uh, so I thought, this, you know, this was great. I always enjoyed going to the youth center when I was a kid. And, and so when I retired, I uh, started as the director at the teen center. And I've been there over 15 years. And I love it. Love hanging out with the kids, shooting pool. We built a stage for some of them to develop their musical abilities. Uh, we 
bring some uh, national talent in from time to time for them for their entertainment and it's just it's just been a great experience at, uh, at Tuscarora Park. When I was young out on Long Island we had a youth center but we had I think there was I don't know if there was two pool tables or just one pool table and a ping pong table and there was a, this old jukebox mm -hmm. and it had about three good songs on it but <laughs> I would, that first thing when I'd go in there is I'd punch those three th songs over and over and over and over again because I didn't want anybody playing the other songs which were junky songs. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was, you know, for a youth center, when you see the, you know, the, the park center over here, the teen center there, it's beautiful over there. They did a nice job for the kids there. Well, you know, one of the things, and, and you know, where this is, we're talking about music, and one of the things that kind of impresses me about some of the games that have come to, to be since the Teen Center was built uh, was uh, rock, uh, rock Band and Guitar Hero. The kids have them on their TVs at home, but we put them on the big screen, uh, and we put them through a big sound system that belongs to me. And so they, and they can perform on the stage with the rock band or the guitar hero just like they're playing in a regular venue. That's cool. Or they can get sit down and put it on the big screen uh, in front of them, the projection screen. And the thing that I always admired about those two games, they were playing classic oldies. Right. Like Deep Purple and, and some of the good and, music you know, that your guys are playing on here. Right, and I noticed, you know, because I DJ and... And I would notice kids coming up asking for some of these songs, and it's like, where are they hearing this? And eventually I yep. figured it out. They were, it was on their games. <laughs> so those two, whoever, uh, the wisdom of the people that put those games out are responsible for, I think, a lot of the youth and a lot of these kids learning some of the good old classic rock and roll songs that, uh, that, that were, right. were great songs of our era. You're listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local with our guest tonight, Sam Hitchcock. 102.3 is WDPE LP FM. DNP 102.3 FM, Saturday Night Live and Local. Special guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. And right now we're going to get back to our conversations. You had some story related to this next song I'm going to play? Yeah, we were just talking about that a few minutes ago off the air. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's going back way back to the early times, uh, my earlier younger days when I first started playing music. Uh, we had a band, uh, it was really the first band I ever had, it was called The Chancellors. And there was five of us. We had two guitar players, a sax player, uh, Wayne Roth, uh, Tim Hicks was on the drums, and, and I played the bass. Uh, Mike King guitar and Mike Ploss was the lead guitar. So we were competing at Eurexville at the Clay Week Battle of the Bands. We hadn't been playing that long, and there were two other bands that were in there. One was called the Roving Daytonas. They were great. And there was another band called the New Tones. I think it was John, Joey Montero's group, and they were great. These two bands played rock and roll of that day. And we didn't do that. You know, most of the stuff that we played uh, was what, what they called standards. You know, we played, uh, you know, for the older groups at the Elks and the Eagles and stuff like that. So we were really out of our league. And uh, I thought, we're going to get skunked here, guys. But... We competed anyway, and uh, I think the the uh, top prize was 50 bucks. We was going to make 10 bucks a piece if we won, which we didn't think we would. Uh, so when these guys, the first two bands, are playing some of the heaviest rock that, of the day, and I'm looking over at the uh, judges, and the judges were older people. They weren't young people. They were older people. And I, I got an idea. I told Wayne, I said, you know, I said, I think we can maybe pull this thing out of the bag if we play it smart. There's two songs that we did, and each band only had two songs to play. One of the songs we played was a saxophone feature with uh, Wayne Roth. Uh, it was called Tequila. And Wayne, Wayne did a heck of a job with that. And then the other one was a comedy song that we did called Long Tall Texan. So we did both those songs. And I kept looking over at the judges, and they were tapping their feet and smiling and looking at each other. And, and we won the talent show. And, of course, the other bands, they were real happy. <laughs> but in addition to the $50, we were 
given the opportunity to back up a special entertainer that was performing for the festival that year. And that entertainer's name was Billy Joe Royal. So we didn't know any of his songs. We didn't know any rock and roll songs at all. So we practiced the entire night before that day that we were going to be in the auditorium backing up Billy Joe Royal. Uh, we learned all of his songs. I think he had like five songs. Uh, Down in the Boondocks, I Knew You Win, uh, three others. And we learned all of his songs. And then when uh, he performed in the Yorksville High School, auditorium we were the band that supported him and that was great <laughs> hey let's play that song for him this is billy joe royal and down in the boondocks dnp 102.3 fm this is saturday night live and local i'm your host tonight larry carroll uh, johnny t usually has this slot and he was uh, a little under the weather so i'm kind of filling in Johnny does a great job, so it's hard to fill those shoes. My special guest is Sam Hitchcock, and we've been talking about some stories. We just played that down in the boondocks, so that must bring back some memories from that one, huh? Yeah, that's memories from a long, long time ago. Uh, I would like to think that I have gained uh, a little bit more abilities uh, after those early days. You know, that's when we got into rock and roll and we started playing uh, pretty much top 40 at, at uh, the Mustang. And uh, then when Kelly and I went on the road, uh, you know, that was a great experience. Uh, like I said uh, before, we the first job that we had was in uh, Holiday Inn East in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, How would you find these gigs? Well, we uh, called a uh, booking agent in Cincinnati, DS Talent that we had uh, was referred to from another friend who was playing music and we told him hey we got a two piece band we'd like to uh, go on the road and uh, so Don just, Sheets so they just kind of line up a bunch of gigs that well, way or, I mean a, a lot of the agencies would book you two weeks at a time but the nice thing about DS talent is their jobs were open-ended. So in other words, you they book you into a spot, and as long as you're happy there and the place is happy with you playing, you can stay as long as you want. We were the whole summer of 75 at the Holiday Inn East, and the only reason we left there is because we wanted to go somewhere else. While we were out there, the Holiday Inn East was such a busy uh, hotel motel that it was cheaper for them rather than give us a room. They rented an apartment across the freeway, brand-new apartment complex, two-bedroom apartment, and they paid, they put us in there. And it was just like being at home. We had a kitchenette. We went out and bought pots and pans and stuff. We put a phone in with a phone number. We were in a book. We had, had a, a, a swimming pool, a laundry room. Uh, so the Holiday Inn couldn't afford to, to room you? It was cheaper. I guess the, it was cheaper for them to uh, put us in an apartment rather than uh, tie up two rooms. That is kind of funny. And... Uh, a maid would come over in a van. A couple of maids come over every Monday in a van, and they would clean the place. And they would leave Kleenex boxes and toilet paper, palms, uh, Kleenex and toilet paper. And we couldn't use it as fast as they brought it. We kept telling them, you know, we're, you might as well take this back. And they said, no, we're supposed to leave it. So when we left, we took <laughs> bags full of Kleenex and toilet paper with us. <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, I think the most embarrassing time I had out there uh, was that they used to give us just about every place we played. We either get a discount on food or they we get a free a free meal of the day or something. And that's what Tulsa was. They give us one free meal a day. So I would go into the restaurant and it's a pretty pretty classy restaurant. There was a big glass wall, and on the other side of the glass wall is a swimming pool, and then on the other side there was rooms in the the hotel. Uh, I went in one day and sat down. They had these great big tablecloths and, uh, you know, cloth napkins and everything real fancy. And I went ahead and, and got lunch. And, of course, I always tuck, tuck my uh, napkin down in my belt. And when, when I was getting ready to leave after I was done, I got up and started to walk away. And I, I forgot to take the napkin out of my belt. And what I didn't realize also had the uh, tablecloth tucked in my belt. So I cleaned the table off. <laughs> And uh, everybody in the restaurant thought that was funny. People in the swimming pool were laughing. So <laughs> that was kind of an embarrassing moment. But I thought, I will never see these people again. So It just seems, um, you know, when you drive that far for a gig that, you know, I, I, you know I, I just wonder how you can afford to do that. You know, between driving there and living there, 
Did well, we got paid. Up? I it mean, paid we, we, we were on salary. We were paid well. And uh, it didn't cost us anything. You know, our room and board was furnished. We got one meal a day, and we did, it didn't cost us for where we were staying. Now, we had to pay for the phone bill. We put the phone in. and uh, But, no, it was uh, our expenses were paid, and everything that we paid on the road was tax deductible because it was traveling expense. So it worked out. It worked out very well for us. Well, you know the story you're telling about the apartment across the street from the hotel. I'm just wondering. Let me play this um, Grand Funk song. I'm just wondering if the hotel was afraid you were going to tear the room down. You know? <laughs> Here's Grand Funk. We're an American band. DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. Tonight our guest is Sam Hitchcock, who's been telling us some stories. And uh, we were in a hotel, but you weren't allowed to stay in there. They put you across the street in an apartment building. And I just thought that was very amusing. <laughs> so. Well, like I say, it was just like being at home. It wasn't uncomfortable at all because most of the time when we traveled and went into a motel, we had to understand that we couldn't accumulate anything because there was only so much room in the motel room. And we had even got to the place where when you went into a motel room, you know what drawers were going to put, you know, your canned goods were going to be here, a little refrigerator be on the top, a socks and underwear would be in another drawer, and, and, you know, just everything would you know where it was going to be because there was only so much room and if we had if we got bought something else then we might have to get rid of something else to be able to put it in the van and go kelly and i when we were on the road we we each bought motorcycles i bought a uh, bsa in broken era oklahoma kelly bought a uh, a honda off of a friend that we knew there and and we used the motorcycles to just kind of drive around and see the the neighborhoods and, and the areas that we were playing in i had time on my hands to do something uh, uh extra and so i started taking flying lessons when i was in tulsa and uh, i started the flying in tulsa and then when we transferred went from tulsa we went down to kingsville texas i w didn't have my license yet so i went ahead and finished my flying uh lessons uh, at corpus christi international airport and my cross country my final solo cross country for my license i flew out of corpus christi to laredo texas and then down along the rio grande river to mcallen texas and then back up along the gulf of mexico into corpus christi to finish out and for my check ride they make us go through all kind of maneuvers this is after the six hour written exam uh frank hover was the uh examiner test examiner I don't know. I don't know how you remember all these names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because half, half time I can't remember my own. But anyway, when we were uh, up flying, the part I was worried about was when he was going to put the hood on. They they teach you to fly uh, with just the instruments in case you'd fly into a cloud or something, get disoriented. So he put the hood on. I had to put the hood on, and then he would say, okay, go this direction, that direction. He'd just zigzag me all over the sky and then took the hood off. He says, okay, now take me home. I had no clue. I had no clue where we were at. I just looked in the direction and kind of like flipping a coin, picked the direction and headed for it <laughs> we, there we were back to the airport <laughs> while you're telling these stories i i just think you know i i know you on facebook and on facebook you're you're known for telling stories <laughs> <laughs> well, these are all true <laughs> that's what i was i was just starting to wonder <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah these are all true any any big stories locally well i don't know about big stories but you know, I remember when I was a kid, uh, it was difficult for us to find a place to practice our music because the, the, the adults didn't want to listen to it. It was noise to a lot of them. Uh, we would set up and practice on my back porch or we would practice in the parking lot at the Dairy Queen, which the Dairy Queen actually liked that because it would draw a lot of kids in. The kids would buy something at the Dairy Queen. Whenever I retired from the police department to take over as director of the teen center, just shortly after I did that, uh, some of the 
the kids came in and wanted to learn how to play music. And so I thought, well, you know, we really don't have any place for them to perform. So I went back to our benefactor, Max Miller, who had given us some money to build the teen center. And I told him what the situation was. He said, go out. And he said, get some estimates. And he says, come back. And he said, we'll take care of it. So Max gave us some money to build a stage onto the teen center. And those kids can come in there and they can make all the noise they want. They're not going to offend anybody. And a lot of these kids have uh, honed their talents to the point where they're performing, some of them worldwide. Uh, I had one of the kids that used to play uh, in one of the battles of the bands that we had that was playing with a band in uh, uh, Japan. Was that Ryan? Yeah. Yeah, he took took lessons from Bobby, too, at at CDs and more. Well, you know, the thing I uh, liked about Ryan is Ryan was into classic rock. When they would come in and play the teen center, they played classic rock. They didn't play the music of the day for the kids. And uh, Ryan Bear, was, uh, he's still a friend. Uh, I talked to him, you know, on Facebook, touch base with him on Facebook. But I think the band he was with was called the Water Band. But they were in, in Japan, and uh, he communicated with me. And that, you know, that was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, But I wanted, to, you know, that was one of the, the things that I wanted, the memories I had about my youth of not, having a place to practice or a place to play our music. And I wanted to make sure that that wasn't facing some of these kids that wanted to play. We, we've got, you know, I've got a sound company. We run sound. We give them front of house sound uh, better than most of them could afford. So it's, uh, it's kind of like full circle to me. Well, and you know, that kind of reminds me of, of this place, you know, with all the volunteers here. When I was growing up, there was no place like this where I could try and be a DJ. And here, right in this town, if there's some kids listening tonight, if you are interested in broadcasting, you know, stop by. Steve Slentz is here uh, in the mornings from 6 until 9, and he can give you information about how you can volunteer, maybe have your own show on, on a local radio station. It's pretty cool. Well, this uh, I think this this station is pretty cool, and, and a lot of people say that. it's uh, You know, this this is a great community anyway, uh, and I, I say this about uh, not, not Dover or North Philly individually. Dover Philly community is basically one, one huge community separated only by a healthy athletic rivalry. And uh, it's a it's a great area, and uh, it just seems like every time you turn the corner, something new is happening to make it more exciting and better. And this this radio station is one of those. We are really very together. You know, the Dover Philly people. You know, some people live in Philly, but they grew up in Dover. Some people the opposite way. So. Oh yeah. Well, when I was on the police department, where we really. Uh, recognized the uh, the cooperation was with the safety forces. You know, when something was going on in Dover, Philly was over there. When something was going on in Philly, we had backup from Dover. And uh, it, it is. It's just, uh, you know, the communities uh, work very well together. Proud to be a public servant as a policeman. I'm proud to be a public servant on city council. And I pr- uh, consider myself a public servant with, uh, you know, doing the, the free concerts at uh, not only the... the Tuscora Park, but at Dover Park, uh, we do the series at the, in the amphitheater there, and uh, it's just a great place to be, and, and music is a part of, of so many things in this area that uh, this station uh, just helps augment that. And you are listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. How about a Beatles song as a tribute to Dover, Philly? Let's do it. <laughs> the Beatles come together. DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. Our guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. We just listened to the Beatles come together, and it just kind of reminded me, Chuck Berry, in one of his songs, he had, you know, that that one line about, here come old flat top, grooving up slowly. Listen to this uh, little outtake from one of Chuck Berry's songs. New Jersey Turnpike in the wee wee hours I was rolling slow because of Top. He was moving up with me, then come waving goodbye in a little old suit of <laughs> That's where the Beatles got it from, was from Chuck Berry. They used to listen to a lot of Chuck Berry and and Little Richard. And you're not on there. They were trying to uh, mimic 
what American music was doing at that time, and it came came back as an entirely new sound just because of the way they were doing it. Yeah, they <clears throat> they took what what they were listening to over here and remanufactured it and and launched it over here and invaded the country with yeah, it. Absolutely. Let me take care of a couple of things here. DNP 102.3 is non-profit and non-commercial. We're supported by listeners like you. And you are listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. If you're expecting to hear Johnny T, Johnny was uh, not feeling real well this evening and asked me if I would sit in for him. And I said, why, sure, Johnny. Anyway, our special guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock, and we've been sharing some stories about his musical adventures and about the, the uh, teen park place. The Park Place Club, whatever. The, what, what are the Park act? Place Teen Center was called. Yeah. I knew it had some kind of an official name to it. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it. What other stories would you like to share with us tonight? Well, uh, I think I would like to go back uh, to the early days of, of my being a parent. Uh, you know, one of the best things, uh, best decisions I ever made in my life was to be a parent, become a parent. It's it's gained rewards and pays dividends that are continuing on. Uh, you know, someone once said that our children are the rainbows of life and the grandchildren are the pot of gold at the end. And, and boy, that couldn't be any truer. When my first two biological children were young, uh, music was a very big part of my life during their time because that's when I was playing in the bands. So it, they were kind of uh, bombarded with music just by by the fact of being around me. And I considered that a, a positive influence on, on their lives. You know, the music of, the, of that day and uh, my son... Jimmy, uh, who is a captain of the day shift in uh, Dover Police Department, uh, he followed me into music, and then later on he followed me into police work. But when he was young, I set him on a, uh, put him on a set of drums when he was seven years old. Then when he turned 14 years old, I put him on stage. And he and Kathy Rafe and myself, we had a group called The Generation Gap, and that was because of the age differences between the, the three of us. And we played for a while, and uh, but Jimmy, you know, Jimmy stuck with it, and uh, he's become quite a musician himself. He started on the drums. Uh, he's playing bass now uh, in the band. Uh, they call their self the Half Fast Band. You have to be careful how you say that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's uh, it's a three-piece band, and uh, I guess I'm I have sat in with him a couple times, and, and going to be doing that again. But uh, he's he's uh, you know he well he, at one time Mike Harbaugh well, he was in that band. Who Mike Harbaugh? Yeah, he he still is. That's that's my nephew. Oh, is that right? Yeah, on my wife's side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's a guitar, quite a guitar player. I, you know, I remember when he was just a little kid, and and the next thing you know, he's he's playing, tinkering with the guitar and stuff. And then, you know, I hadn't seen well, him for Kenny quite Mesker. a while. Kenny yeah. Mesker's a drummer. Yeah. And but quite... then, you know, I hadn't seen Mike for a while, and then all of a sudden, next thing I know, he's playing in a band, and and yeah. I went to see him, and he was really good. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They they do. They have a nice sound, and uh, you know, I'll be doing uh, doing some keys with him. So we're, we're kind of looking forward. We're going to be playing the last couple of weekends of this month. Who knows from there? But uh, That's, That is a cool name, the half ass Band. Well, I'll tell you how that came, came about is uh, when Jimmy was playing in the band with me, one of the things we used to say uh, was, we, I say, we'll play anything you want to hear. We say, we don't play songs too slow. We don't play them too fast. We just play them half fast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he just kind of took that as a... I hope you don't get canceled off the air for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we'll be okay. Okay. But uh, I've been very proud of uh, all my children, but uh, very proud of my son uh, who has followed me, uh, you know, into music and is, is still playing music. I think, uh, you know, having music in his life has... Uh, it has helped him uh, along the way. It, it just kind of takes the edge off of life sometimes, especially uh, with some of the things you see uh, on the streets uh, in law enforcement. Okay. Now, um, 
as far as like when you played at, at the Delphian and, and around those years, was there any other local clubs that competed with them? Because I yeah, know we played all the clubs. Yeah. <laughs> we played about every play. Carl Carl Dreyer and I, uh, you know, we played as Gemini for like I say, twenty five years. Uh, we've lasted longer than most marriages, and Carl and I have played for many many wedding receptions and it it really makes me feel good to have somebody come up and say hey you guys played at our 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 wedding and of course my first question were you guys still together and they said well yes we are <laughs> so i guess we've got a a pretty good record of uh playing successful wedding receptions that uh, that seemed to to last wasn't there a place downtown in philly a club right near where where robert's men's shop yeah is? that was the well it was the rose room Okay, that was the Rose Room. That was the Rose Room, and then uh, later it became, uh, they changed it and be called the uh, Wind Chasers. It was under different okay. management. And uh, now I wasn't, <clears throat> I didn't play when it was Wind Chasers. I was a policeman, and, and we used to handle a lot of the overflow that came out of the bar when it was Wind Chasers. But uh, they had they had a lot of good entertainment there, though. They had some. I like, remember seeing that hobo guy, Boxcar Willie. Boxcar Willie? He played there. He, he autographed my album and everything. Well, John <laughs> Kay and Steppenwolf played there. Wow. Uh, I saw John Kay and Steppenwolf yeah. uh, playing at the Island Garden out on Long Island. That was back in the heyday. So. Yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of a, a good group. I, I'm trying to think of... I think we've we played a couple of Steppenwolf songs, but yeah, I played uh, Carl and I played a lot of different places around here. We played a lot of weddings and uh, just a lot of the clubs. and And the nice thing about a two piece band is you can compete with some of the four and five piece bands and give a club owner a better deal on on what they're paying out for entertainment because they're only two pieces. But the, the nice thing about it is we were putting out. Uh, we'd say we're a two-piece band. We put out the music of a four- and five-piece band. And we were able to do that with a lot of the electronics that's available today. Plus, you had to work harder. <laughs> All right, let's play something from uh, the Scorpions. Good band. This one's Rock You Like a Hurricane. Great band. NP 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. And if you're just tuning in, we have our special guest tonight is Sam Hitchcock. Uh, Johnny T is not with us tonight. He's not feeling very well. I'm Larry Carroll. I have a show on Sunday nights at 6 called The History of Rock. So if you're not doing anything tomorrow night, tune in. Tomorrow night's show, we're going to be uh, featuring music of the Beatles. Getting back to our special guest, Sam Hitchcock. I know you mentioned playing the drums occasionally and playing the bass and the keyboards. Was there anything else that you play? Or? Well, when I was in high school, you know, my main instrument was the baritone. And, of course, the baritone has a mouthpiece and the three valves, uh, so it wasn't very difficult to transition into the trumpet, a uh, smaller mouthpiece. But, uh, you know, I've, I have a trumpet, and uh, I've played trumpet uh, in different groups that I've been in. I play... Uh, played a little bit of guitar, acoustic guitar. I played a little bit of electric guitar, not a whole lot. I wouldn't call myself a lead player. Played the drums with uh, Kelly for five years. Keyboard right now is, is probably my main instrument, and when I play keyboard, it's very difficult for me to play keyboard without keeping that left hand playing the bass part because that's what I've done so much of. Now, when I play with Jimmy, I have to tie that hand behind my back so I can just <laughs> play the right hand of the keyboard. But, uh, you know, anything, you know, I played a little bit of harmonica, played uh, probably the most right now is uh, that I stick with is the keyboard because that's the foundation uh, for music theory. I, I don't know that I'll ever uh, venture into anything other than that. <laughs> when I had uh, my music store, Mike McWilliams did uh, lessons for me on guitar and Bobby did Mike was good. drum lessons. And I asked Mike one day, I said, what's the hardest instrument to play and he said it's the first one <laughs> so i evidently i never learned to to play the first one so <laughs> but i you know i always loved music and that i always wanted to be involved with it and you know the dj thing came along and i i could figure out which buttons to push and what music to play so it worked out for me well, you've, do, you've done an ex excellent job with that for many years i mean that's mm -hmm. uh, everybody knows larry carroll 
Well, thank you. And then from your music career, then you kind of drifted into um, sound. How, how'd that come about? Well, I was playing uh, when I was hired to start the uh, program at the amphitheater at, at the Tuscore Park. Uh, I was approached by uh, Kerry Gardner once uh, one football game, and I think it was 1977. I was working a football game as a policeman, and he told me that they'd renovated the amphitheater and wanted to know if I would be interested in uh, putting a program together. And, of course, I said, yeah. I said, I'd love to do that. And uh, so they b gave me a little bit of a budget and turned it over to me. I come up with the name Summer Showcase and started programming uh, entertainment uh, throughout the summer, uh, from Memorial Day through Labor Day. I went out and got some more sponsors, got different entertainment, and pretty much uh, scheduled all the Sundays. The sound system that they had at the time wasn't adequate, so I, I wound up, when we started bringing bigger bands in, I wound up bringing uh, my PA system from home, uh, and that worked for a while, and then it got to the place where we just needed uh, needed a bigger system, a, a dedicated system. So I uh, went to Kerry with that request. He, he got uh, was able to get some grants, and we got some professional sound equipment, and... Uh, started running sound for a lot of the bands that would come in. Uh, then we started getting requests to go out away from the amphitheater for other uh, bands to play in other venues. And uh, so I had to uh, start investing in some of my own equipment to, to, to be able to do that. And that's how the sound company got started in, in 2003. And it has just mushroomed to the point where last year we started doing installations and retail sales and uh, we do probably about nine or ten festivals a year that we run sound. We'll do concerts, sound, rent systems, just about anything that that has to do with music. You want to go down and throw tin cans in the river and want music, I'll set up a sound system for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's a natural evolution, you know, from being in a band and working with sound equipment to being out in front of the sound equipment running sound for the band. So. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, when I took over the teen center as the director, uh, it was kind of natural to uh, be able to supply uh, a sound system. It made it easier to when I supplied sound system for the bands that would come in. Some of the local bands didn't have adequate sound, so I started supplying for them. And uh, that made it, it made it more comfortable for them to play. While they were learning to uh, to play their music, we were were furnishing them with a good PA system. And uh, I'll never forget uh, during one particular f middle school field trip, a young man came in uh, whose eyes got big around as <laughs> as quarters when he saw the sound equipment. And I started uh, feeding him the manuals and, and teaching him what I could about it. Uh, he took right into it. Uh, that uh, young man is 21 years old uh, today. His name is Travis Green, and he is my chief engineer with the sound company. I can send him anywhere with any of the equipment I've got, the biggest uh, system I've got, and he can take care of it. He currently runs sound for the uh, end of summer celebration in Dover uh, with uh, our biggest system, pumps out 25,000 watts front of house, does a marvelous job. And that's right from the teen center. That's from the teen center and from from the sound company that, uh, yeah, that's where he came from. He came from the teen center. So I gained another son. <laughs> and it sounds like a great place to hang out. At teen it center. is. And uh, it's the thing that's different about Park Place, that different from what uh, youth centers used to be, that were open Saturday night for a few hours. Park Place is open every day through the week. We open up right after school. Kids come in. They can hang out in a safe environment, get something to eat, play the video games, get on the computer. And believe it or not, uh, a lot of them will sit in the booth and do homework. And what's the membership charge? Or? Well, you don't have to be a member to come into Park Place, but uh, membership is uh, $12 a year, a whole dollar a month. And members get uh, one free Raymond noodle every day, uh, <laughs> which they love. They go through those like, <laughs> like you won't believe. You know, 12 of those, and they paid for their membership because we, ha we have to charge. We'll charge them a dollar if they buy one. Okay. So, now, that, that's great. And, you know, even when my kids were little and I'd bring them over to the park and they could ride for, like, 15 cents, they'd get on the merry-go-round for 20 minutes or something. Yeah, you know, everything was always relatively inexpensive most of the times it was done 
just enough to support the systems and and they weren't out to make a whole lot of money off of the people no and and that's that's because of rty which was a, a company that was developed out of new philadelphia rotary club when there was an insurance problem back in the mid 80s uh, rty is the management of the not-for-profit management company that uh, operates uh, the majority of the amusements at tuscora park and they do keep the the prices are affordable uh, and it's, it, you know, we have definitely have a, a, uh, a real gem in the community with Tuscora Park. Uh, it is a, a favorite project of many, many different things with uh, New Philly Rotarians. I'm proud to be a Rotarian and uh, also proud to uh, participate in a lot of the things that, uh, the good things that go on in Tuscora Park. All right. You're listening to DNP 102.3 FM. This is saturday night live and local and our guest tonight is sam hitchcock i'm going to play one of uh, a song from another one of his favorite groups and this one's from poison P 102.3 FM. This is Saturday Night Live and Local. Usually Johnny T's here, but he is not feeling well this evening. I'm Larry Carroll sitting in for him. Normally I'm here on Sunday nights, and I'll be here tomorrow at 6 with the History of Rock. Tonight we have our guest Sam Hitchcock, and we're getting near the 11 o'clock hour, so we're going to start to wrap it up. I just wanted to ask your advice to kids today thinking of playing an instrument or getting into a band, what would you say? Well, I think we have some excellent uh, instructors in the area, in the school systems. Uh, I know uh, many of them personally, and uh, they try to, uh, you know, will guide, uh, you know, help the kids achieve what they have the talent to do, uh, whether it be vocal music or instrumental music. I think we're really rich in the area with the, with a lot of the instructors that we have in the, in the school systems. Some of the kids, I mean, you know, that's what they want to do if they want to do concert band or uh, maybe get into dance band or anything like that i think there are plenty of opportunities you know you mentioned bobby and dan gribble that was on uh, here uh, one time he's an excellent instructor on guitar uh, we've got we've got a lot of great musicians around here that are willing to share their talents with young people and uh, music is a happy world it's a it's a, a world that will take you out of the blues or take you into the blues if you need to be in the blues. But it seems like, uh, it's always seemed to me that when whatever mood I was ever in, whatever, whatever was going on in my life, it seemed like there was a song that told the story. And uh, there was always a way to, uh, you know, you could get yourself out of a bad mood by just putting on one of your favorite happy tunes. And, uh, you know, music has been a big influence on my life since, since I ever knew that uh, music existed. It's been a big influence on uh, my children and my grandchildren are, get, are getting into music now. And, and uh, I would encourage uh, any young people who have the desire or have any kind of an incentive to, uh, to, to have anything to do with music, uh, you know, explore it. You know, uh, make the effort to uh, to follow through on it. I think you'll you'll be happy. Yeah, and and the funny thing is, music is the only universal language that we have. In other words, when you have a sheet music in Russia or China or the United States, it's all the same. It's the only universal thing that we have in mankind. Music is a universal language, and love is the key. There you go. Yeah. That's all you need. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up. This was Saturday Night Live and Local, and we want to thank uh, Sam Hitchcock for joining us tonight and Vanessa for taking pictures to record the history of this. And we're going to wrap it up tonight and just say good night. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Vanessa. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. You're welcome. Glad to have you here, Sam. DNP 102.3 is WDPE LPFM, Dover, New Philadelphia.